case that the international community is legitimate to use military force against um, national governments. As you know, the, this document was triggered by the failure to act uh, in uh, occasion of the Rwanda massacre of 1994. 800,000 800, people were killed in uh, Rwanda in an ethnic uh, civil war between Tutsi and Hutu. Um, and uh, um, the international community did nothing to stop Tutsi being killed by the, uh, by the Hutu ethnic groups. Um, and that passed through history, um, I mean, was generally perceived as the quintessential example of um, guilty by a guilty failure to act on the part of the international community. I mean, we should have done something to stop that kind of massacre, that kind of genocide. Um, in the aftermath of that massacre, I mean, aftermath, 10 years later, uh, on the initiative of the Canadian government, uh, a document was issued and then approved by the General Assembly of the United Nations hold the responsibility to protect, in which criteria were given to say when the international community is legitimate, is permitted, and is also obliged to act and to use, if necessary, military force to stop uh, certain human rights violations. And what, one of the things that this document does is to identify only few human rights violations that trigger a legitimate military intervention on the part of the international community, one of which is genocide, not surprisingly. Uh, but of course, uh, another one is ethnic cleansing. Um, so, we can have that we can identify few human rights violations that trigger this kind of intervention without being brought to the counterintuitive conclusion that all human rights are, are exactly those things that if violated trigger international uh, in, uh, intervention. So uh, this is the mistake that Rawls does and that the human rights, the philosophy of human rights have rightly reacted against. Okay, um, at this point, uh, no, let me, if I've given you the list of usual, the common mistakes, that people make in conceiving of human rights. Now let me give you the positive side of the story that is also uh, in virtue of uh, awareness of these mistakes, we can at least attempt the first list of defining features of human rights that we might then perhaps discuss. So, human rights are political norms dealing mainly with how people should be treated by their government and institutions. They are not ordinary moral norms applying mainly to interpersonal conduct. So, prohibition of lying or prohibition of private violence should not count as a human rights violation. Famously, Pogge puts it uh, uh, in this way, to engage human rights, conduct must be in some sense official. So the potential violators of human rights, as I said, are at least prima facie political officials, representative of the, representatives of the government. But we must be careful because some rights, such as rights against racial or sexual discrimination, are primarily concerned to regulate private behavior. So 
again, it's not the case that uh, in all cases a human right violation occur only when a public official commits the violation. There could be cases in which there is private violence or private uh, uh, violation of basic rights that is a human right violation, especially to the extent in which the government has not done all uh, that was in its power to prevent that kind of uh, crime. Okay, so second feature uh, is that human rights exist as moral and or legal rights. So it can exist, this is the existence question, it can exist as a shared norm of actual human moralities, as a justified moral law norm supported by strong reasons, as a legal right at the national level, uh, as a legal right, as a legal right within the international law. So, uh, we might wish uh, that human rights exist in all these four different forms, as a moral right, as a ju justified moral law norm supported by strong reasons, uh, as a, a legal right already recognized by some national legislation, as a legal right as part of the international law, uh, we can wish that human rights have, exist in all these four forms, but that's not necessarily the case. We can have a human right that is still only a moral norm that has not been translated yet into a, a, a legal uh, right at the national and or international level, or vice versa, we can have a human right that exists only in the uh, list of uh, uh, human rights already recognized by the international law and that is questionable whether it's part of uh, shared moralities around the world. So freedom of religion, for example, is certainly a legal right already present in the international law but it's questionable whether uh, it is uh, commonly accepted uh, as a moral right shared by most moralities uh, around the world. I mean, even in the Christian world, the idea that uh, freedom of religion is a, is a value, is something that each religious religion is interested in uh, protecting, is a kind of late achievement. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, there are still certain um, traditions in which uh, freedom of religion is utterly considered as something immoral. I mean, you cannot abandon uh, your Muslim faith uh, according to certain uh, interpretation of the Sharia without committing a legal uh, crime. So. Um, we cannot say that freedom of religion is part of accepted moralities or it's a, share, it's a norm that we find in all major moralities or moral traditions of the world because that's, that's clearly not the case. So that's an example of how uh, a human right exists only as an international, as a piece of international law and does not exist as a moral right, at least as a, not as a moral right shared by most traditions. Third, human rights are many. So one of the defining features of human rights is that you don't have one human right or two. Uh, I mean, Locke had only three, if you want, but that's, uh, that's not the way we conceive of human rights today. Human rights are numerous, are many, several dozen rather than few, and therefore they get also specific. You don't have, like Kant, a human right to freedom and equality, period an innate right to freedom and equality. That's it. Uh, human rights are uh, more than that. But therefore more specific than that. You don't have a human right to freedom, you have a human right to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of participating into your political life, freedom from torture, and so on. Um, so they get, they are many and therefore they are specific. 
fourth, human rights are minimal uh, and uh, therefore modest standards. They are much more, as Nigel puts it, concerned with avoiding the terrible rather than achieving the best. And uh, uh, fifth, they are international norms covering all countries and all peoples living today uh, and uh, are universal, provided that by universal we understand uh, that certain human rights documents protect the rights of only certain groups, children, women, minorities, so are universal and, you know, qualified in this way. And of course, sixth, this is a good um, uh, juncture to the next topic, they require robust justification that apply everywhere and support their role, which sometimes, as I told you, although only in very few and well-specified cases, justify the use of force by the international community. So precisely for this reason, precisely for the huge political consequences that are attached to human rights, we want to have a strong justification behind them. And obviously this leads us to the question that uh, I want to make central in this course, which as I already anticipated is the question of the justification of human rights, the foundation of human rights. Okay, let me uh, stop at the end of this very uh, general, if not generic, uh, interpretation, I mean introduction um, to human rights to ask you whether uh, something of the things I've said uh, is not clear, whether you want to add something, whether um, you know, there are things you want to ask at this point before we start our little uh, foundational uh, game. Uh, as I said, if you want to ask me questions in Portuguese, I think I'll be able to understand. Uh, yeah? Uh, how would you describe the case of the recent Rohingyas, uh, those tribal uh, mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. um, in the light of the responsibility to protect? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what happened? Because I'm afraid I'm not uh, informed enough. What happened to these tribes? There is a, a people, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Cambodia, okay. who has been uh, slaughtered recently. Yeah. Yeah, my, yeah, my. Yeah, my. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, okay, now I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. How would I describe that? Well, from the point of view of human rights, I think. Uh, well, that's a clear case of ethnic cleansing, which, under certain circumstances, uh, according to the responsibility to protect, legitimates military intervention by the international community. Now, this gets us into the business of the right to intervention or humanitarian uh, intervention, uh, or to use the language uh, used by that document, the responsibility to protect. Okay, well one of the things that people who are skeptical of the very idea of using military force to protect human rights is the following. Ah, well you know, in principle I'm not against the idea of using force to protect civilians from slaughter, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and stuff like that. But there is a problem of consistency, because sometimes the international community seems to be willing <coughs> to get its hands there and do something, uh, and sometimes, you know, nothing happens. Uh, so imagine also the, the case of human rights violation in China the huge, um, uh, 
human rights violation that happened on the outskirts of the empire, it seems pretty bad and stuff like that. Uh, this, is a, this is a strong argument. I mean, if, if you want to have a norm uh, uh, you know, within the international law, it has to be applied uh, consistently. So in all cases in which you have a government, uh, well, in this case, it's not exactly the government that is responsible for this kind of uh, slaughtering, right? It's another, it's another group of people, but uh, you know, there is certainly a responsibility of the government that doesn't stop the violators uh, uh, doing what they're doing. So, uh, some people say either you apply this norm that all the times there is a genocide, the risk of a genocide, an ethnic cleansing case, you intervene, or you never intervene, uh, because you cannot pick and choose, so to speak. Well, I'm not convinced by this argument. Uh, I'm not convinced because one of the things that the responsibility to protect was very careful to clarify is that before you trigger a military force for the sake of human rights protections, you have to make a political judgment about whether your intervention doesn't cause more evil than is supposed to prevent or stop. And that political judgment has to take into account the forces in the field. So why don't we intervene against China for its human rights violation? Because we don't want to start a third world war. <laughs> because that would be much worse than the human rights violation of which China is responsible. And many people think, ah, oh, but that's, that's real politique. No, it's not real politique. It's uh, I think at least it's good political judgment. I mean, if you really care about the human rights of people around the world, you have to make a sincere and well thought out assessment of whether your intervention is going to do good or bad. Now, that's one argument that one may have about humanitarian intervention. The other one is more straightforward and says, look, this, this whole idea of the responsibility to protect humanitarian intervention and stuff like that is rhetoric. It's just the West that gives itself a, a, a permission to decide when it's in its an interest to intervene. So, I don't know, many people think that Libya was one of these cases. I mean, that there, there was an explicit uh, reference to responsibility to protect when that uh, intervention was authorized by the Security Council of the United Nations with the abstention of uh, Russia and China. Um, so, the Security Council made reference to the responsibility where they can say, okay, we have here civilians that are under the threat. Remember, Gaddafi said, I'm going to get there and kick your ass I mean, in, in the Shirenaiga area of Libya. I'm going to make a genocide, and at that point, you know, uh, there was a sort of clear justification on the part of the international community to start the bombing and so on and so forth. That was already started by France without authorization, but then there was an ex post authorization by the Security Council. So, this is a different argument. This is the argument that says it's not a question of consistency, it's a question of that in all cases, Humanitarian intervention masks the real interest behind uh, the intervention because the international community is not going to act only when uh, there is a humanitarian crisis. If there is no interest behind, nobody is going to use military force, risk losing lives or equipment, or military equipment, just for the sake of the poor Sudanese people who, uh, you know, in South Sudan, uh, uh, there was that, that other genocide about which the international community didn't do much. Well, I'm not convinced by that argument either, at least in, you know, from purely theoretical point of view, because it seems to be saying, unless your intentions are pure, so it looks like a Kantian argument, right? 
unless you show me that when you intervene for the sake of human rights, no other interests are at stake but the humanitarian one, or you are not allowed to intervene. And if that is the case, then of course there is no truly humanitarian intervention, because it's true that superpowers or you know countries that uh, have the power to to use military force are not going to intervene simply, merely for the sake of helping foreigners not to be slaughtered uh, or stuff like that. There is always a political judgment in saying, well, yes, perhaps we care about these people, but we also want to keep the international peace, for example, because this is in our interest. Or, you know, even up to the point of saying, well, if we stabilize a certain region of the world, then we can do business with them. And that's important for us. This, there is an economic in Now, many people think, if that is your kind, the kind of reasoning that goes on in the heads of rulers around the world, then humanitarian intervention is always a fraud. I don't think so, honestly. I think that what counts from a normative point of view is to decide whether that kind of our, the, uh, intervention is going to do good to the victims or not. That's the only thing that counts. So, what matters in uh, deciding whether a specific humanitarian intervention uh, is morally legitimate or not is, on the one hand, whether it respects the preconditions that are described in the, the responsibility for them. And on the other hand, whether which itself is one of the things that the Responsibility Protect clarifies, whether you have strong reasons to believe that if you intervene, and by intervention it's not necessarily the case that you need to think of airplanes bombing, I mean also an economic sanction is a form of interference. What matters is whether you have strong reasons to believe that whatever you do to interfere with that national government is going to make life of people better than it would be if you did not intervene. That is the only serious, in my opinion, moral criterion that you want to have in assessing whether a specific case of humanitarian intervention is okay or not. Now, you, you may be mistaken uh, in think. I mean, you can have strong reasons that lead you to think that that intervention is going to do good to people and then you know, realize that that was not the case. I mean, you cannot ask for infallibility in your political judgment, but at least you have to show me, me being the, the international community, that there are strong reasons to believe that your intervention is going to uh, prevent a genocide and not create the position of another genocide. So, for example, the bombing of, I mean, I have a lot of Serbian friends, but I mean, the bombing of uh, Belgrade in 1999 to stop what was going on in Kosovo was quite efficient. Uh, it did stop that potential genocide. Of course, at some cost, because you were bombing the city. Um, so, uh, it is always a very tough call, uh, because it, it presupposes good political judgment. and having a good political judgment about the consequences of your action is one of the most difficult things uh, you can do. Thank you. Um, just directly to this. Uh, on the other side, it seems to me that this uh, accusation, this uh, objection about uh, the fact that there are interests uh, hidden behind the intervention is not as good so, well, in some cases, you're right. It's like, you know, you expect some purity of intention. But in other cases, it's important to highlight the sort of double standard. Like, if there is some material interest involved, you will intervene. If not, you let the people die. So, for this reason, you have the impression that appealing to the uh, to genocide or to human violation of human rights is just a, a, in a sense a, an excuse. So let's say I understand when you what you say about having to ponder the consequences of 
the intervention. So of course you don't bomb China because of what is happening in Tibet. But again, let's go to that food. So South Sudan. Uh, I mean, if you bomb uh, Khartoum, if you force the Sudanese, we should say now the North Sudanese government, to stop the genocide, you're not risking a terrible war. No. On the other side, there is no oil there, so there is no material interest and, and no one intervenes. And the same sweat uh, uh, happened in Rwanda, but not in Congo, because Congo is rich on mineral resources and Rwanda not. So, um, in a sense, you can really state or you can really see that there is a, uh, a, there is a coherence in deciding where to intervene and where not. So, in this sense, I understand that. Not because they the critics, not because they okay. want the pure intention, but because they just say, well, you just intervene only when you have material interest. In other okay. cases, and my reply to that is, better in those cases in which, in which material interest and humanitarian care happily merge, than not in, in, uh, uh, considering humanitarian intervention always not permissible. No, but the point is, no, no, it's okay. But uh, let's make an individual analogy. So let's say we go by a bomb and we see two people uh, drawn. One is a Trump, and the other, not Donald Trump, a Trump, uh, let me say, a homeless, homeless person, yeah? And the other one is a millionaire. Let's say, no, a millionaire, okay? And we decide to save, I say two, because of course, if you are alone, you have to choose. But we decide to save the billion, because so we will get some reward also. Mm -hmm. And can you say, well, it is justified because, you know, there is nothing bad. At least one life was saved. Yes, the point is, I could have, we could have saved also the other life. Right. And the point is, you could have intervened also in Darfur or in Rwanda, of course, at some point costs, but then again. Yeah, but again, my point to you is, I, I agree that this is the case, but I'm saying that, uh, to keep it with your analogy, the choice is between not saving either of the two and saving only one. No, the choice is, we, I say one and you say the other. That's why I say we are two of us. Yeah. Again, it is not that the American is only uh, no, no, no. They, they, let's say it's not that the US or the UN has just a limited amount of bombs, so they have to choose carefully do we bomb Belgrade or do we bomb Khartoum? They may bomb the whole earth. So, this is really not the case in which you can appeal to the fact that, well, we have to choose who we were going to save. No, I you understand. I understand. I, I, I just don't know where your argument is going to go, where you want it to take it. I mean, one way to end your reasoning is to say, and since a material interest is always to be part of the picture, it follows that we should stop talking about humanitarian intervention. No, in we general. should. No, no, this is sorry. This is not what I was saying. Okay. I was saying that what the critics say is not let's stop to intervene. Yeah. They just say it is important or hypocritical. These nations are not intervening out of humanitarian reasons, they are right. intervening out of interest. Well, I'm saying that even this is a little bit too much. I mean, I could be sympathetic with this kind of conclusion to the extent in which it doesn't stop humanitarian intervention yeah. in general. Uh, but I think it's also a little bit too much, because sometimes, as our good friend Immanuel Kant uh, taught us, uh, material interest and a genuine concern for humanitarian uh, uh, reasons collide, yes. they merge. Yes. So, uh, you cannot say, uh, well, it's always a fraud, okay, we let it go because sometimes it makes some good, uh, uh, but uh, the presence of material interest show, I mean, the, the fact that material interests are a necessary component of the decision to intervene, uh, make the whole thing hypocritical. No, I mean... Uh, According to Kant, yes. If you act morally well, only when you have a, a direct interest in both, then it's not even a moral action. No, it is not a moral action, but again, we are not talking about morality here, we are we're talking about politics. Yeah, yeah. but still, since you mentioned Kant. Well, Kant is also, 
also said something about politics, I mean, and his way of uh, assessing good political judgment is not the same way in which we assess uh, a moral action, yeah. right? So the importance of consequences have to be part of the picture, otherwise you are a moral fanatic. You are not a, a moral politician. You are either a moral fanatic or a political moralist, which are two different... No, so I'm coming to you. Um, if even for Kant, a good political judgment includes assessment of the consequences of your action, uh, uh, and uh, does not exclude, at least the way I read it, the presence of some material interest, let's call it this way, for uh, acting the way you do, then it seems to me this is the case we are discussing. Um, so I'm trying to <coughs> oppose this natural um, skepticism that people have against the very idea of using s or interfering from economic sanction up to military intervention for the sake of human rights. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's always hiding. It's always hiding something else. Uh, and therefore, there is no genuine concern for the, for the lives of others. I, yeah, I, I'm skeptical for the reason that I've given. Ah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, Well, uh, Luigi, first, thank you for bringing this subject, the philosophy of human rights, here in this historic moment in Brazil, <laughs> that we have a military intervention which is being accused of violating human rights. So, we, uh, in general, you have responsible for the mission says that we we have uh, we are too comprehensive to human rights. Uh, my question is simple. Maybe you are going to touch this problem, but uh, uh, I realize that you are sympathetic with these six families of human rights, with males. And uh, my question is. Uh, how do you solve a possible conflict between rights, the, these families of rights, for instance, between social and economic rights and liberty rights, sometimes they are intention, or, and this is something really important, important for us right now in Brazil, security versus due process, because we have many people being arrested or killed, the name of Security, security in Rio de Janeiro and people are giving absolute priority to security. So how do you solve the conflict of rights? Do you think it is just apparent or we should give some priority to some rights? Well, the first thing I would answer to you is that this is not something that we can decide in a philosophical seminar. I mean, one of the things that I would be saying later is that one of the fascinating things about human rights is that when you do the business of deciding what human rights are, what are, what are the priorities among human rights, as a philosopher what you can do is to give good moral reasons, uh, good normative reasons to say that security should not be the only concern that you have about human rights because to the extent in which it conflicts with due process, uh, you know, uh, freedom from torture, stuff like that, you have to find the balance. And you may also suggest as a philosopher where the balance is to be found uh, in your opinion. But you should not make the the, 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 the additional uh, step towards saying, okay, then this is why, how human rights really have to be uh, conceived of. Because human rights are really also the business of the people to decide. So it's not in our power to decide what human rights are. We can give good reasons. And, but ultimately, it's really the international community that is going to decide 
uh, what counts. I mean, at least you have to imagine a dialectic between a normative argument on the one end and what people think on the other hand. What people think, whether it's justified or not, has to count something to define ultimately what counts as a human right. So, to your question, where we strike the balance uh, in the many human rights that conflict with one another, it's not just security and liberty, but it's also, I don't know, liberty and uh, economic rights. I mean, to a certain extent, you may say we need to limit the freedom of some people around the world in order to make sure that nobody starves I mean, this kind of quasi-libertarian argument. Uh, so, um, I may have a wonderful theory uh, on where uh, this has to stop, uh, but uh, I'm trying to say that uh, ultimately this is not going to be the, the, the last word on the subject, because also the kind of consensus that you find in the international community about where the balance has to be found must count something. Uh, that's fascinating because it's not talking about morality, right? When you when you talk about the foundation of morality, you're pretty much free to say, yeah, okay, that's what the moral law is, in my opinion, and if you think differently, you are simply mistaken. That's not the approach you want to have when you do philosophy of human rights, because here Buchanan, Arlen Buchanan expressed this point extremely well, saying, that, again, that there must be some sort of reflective equilibrium between your theory, I mean, that can be proven to be philosophically stronger than other approaches, so it, there is a sense in making an effort, a theoretical effort, to define a, a good philosophy of human rights. But you always have to remember that if the results that you have from these philosophical efforts are completely alien to what the international community conceives of human rights, then you have to do some. You have to make an effort to reduce the gap. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, it's possible also that, uh, for example, take the, the 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 case of freedom of religion. If there is today no widespread agreement that there should be a human right to freedom of religion, that's because some countries, as I was saying, are not ready to uh, <coughs> guarantee freedom of religion uh, to their children, to their, children, to their citizens. Um, <laughs> maybe it was not a mistake. I mean, it was not a, an accident that I made that mistake. Um, then uh, uh, you can still have a, a human right to freedom of religion and sort of you know, wait uh, or hope that these countries that are not in lines to, with it will come to that conclusion. So, it has to be a dialectic. So, I'm not denying that there is a, a conflict among human rights like Berlin showed about the whole of morality. I mean, the, our moral values are in conflict with one another and it's part of the business uh, of moral theory to find some balance. Um, I mean, there is already already few things are, have been done. One of the limits in the human rights culture that you have uh, in the uh, in the promotion of security is torture. I mean, for example, there, there is a you cannot torture people for the sake of security. That's something that is already established in the human rights culture. I mean, I was noticing, rereading Nigel, that he talks about tortures in most cases. So there is a qualification there. And you know, uh, uh, prima facie you say, oh my god, this guy is allowing torturing. But then you, then you see Zero Dark Thirty, you know, the, 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 the film about how they got Osama Bin Laden. Uh, I don't know if you have seen it. Uh, and one of the criticism against this movie was that it looked like that they were endorsing some form of torture. Now, I'm a Kantian, I should not say that, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> when, when you stop 
Yeah, at the end of the movie, you have a different conception of torture because, I mean, of course, there is torture and torture. I mean, uh, there are different. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to say that uh, even when the boundaries are set, when I mean, you say, okay, security, fine, it's a, it's a map, but that doesn't mean that you have to torture people. Uh, there is still some ambiguity that needs to be uh, tuned there, uh, at least if we talk about our moral intuition, at least my moral intuition. Yeah, I, I don't want to jump to that, but my question actually correlates with Darley's and Zane's uh, question. So I, and you also already mentioned different types of uh, uh, rights that it can exist in human rights. But I want to find out, I want to uh, make a point actually that the problem of the difference between moral rights and a legal right and the importance of uh, conceptual analysis of these rights in the theory of human rights so that perhaps that way we can evaluate the weight that the kind of rights that going to have, uh, there are going to have and we can apply them uh, more with more accuracy in the case of, for example, interventions. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you can, uh, we can make a list that is more or less uh, rigid in these terms and then apply them and so perhaps in that way beginning the conceptual analysis of these rights, we can, uh, we can prevent this kind of uh, errors of judgments and interventions. Because the problem with, I, I agree with this, and the problem with the international uh, interventions, actually Massimo Bohenzo came here two years ago, and he gave the universal just a lot, uh, but he gave the ethical foundations uh, uh, just law. And just war. Just law. war, sorry. War. Yeah. Just war. Okay. Uh, and my problem with that was the same thing that you said, is that you were talking about politics, we're not talking about ethics. Yeah. When you intervene in a country, you take away their sovereignty or their autonomy, the autonomy of those people. And we can talk about uh, Bosnia and Kosovo and Rwanda, but the first humanitarian emergency after World War II was in uh, Nigeria, and it was an alliance between uh, England and the United States and Russia that almost killed all the Eagle people in the east of the country because they want to succeed from Nigeria because they were being killed by the other tribe. So, uh, this kind of things uh, can happen because, again, and we can prevent them from happening again. Yeah. I think if you can, you have to uh, begin to differentiate between moral rights and legal rights and the way they, they, they have been the tradition of legal rights. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not following, I, mean, I didn't understand the connection you are making between uh, moral and legal, the, the issue of whether human rights are moral or legal on the one they don't have a, uh, a relation actually. Okay. Uh, so your point would be the inconsistency <coughs> of humanitarian intervention, let's call it this way, the fact that, you know, sometimes... Time. Yeah, We can have a moral right. Yes. And he, uh, he doesn't have to translate, to translate as a legal right, right? Yes. But for some theories, like Joseph Roth theories, you yes. don't have a connection between moral and legal rights. No, yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. So you, you want me to comment on, yeah. on this idea? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Ras' position uh, is very influential and is, we will be talking about it quite extensively because he's the perhaps most influential representative of the so-called political interpretation of human rights, which pretty much say 
human rights need no moral justification. And so what, what we are doing here is just you know, an academic exercise because human rights are justified by the fact that they are already accepted in the international practice. Uh, there is no need to ask a philosopher whether it's okay to intervene for the sake of preventing a genocide because this is already established, period. Um, so what the ultimate ground of human rights is the international practice. Um, what human rights already do for us. Um, now, there are many, many things you can say against this interpretation. Um, well, one of which is that what human rights are today are the product of that kind of dialectic that I was uh, explaining before between moral reasoning on the one hand uh, and uh, political practice on the other that now led to a sort of consensus about this at least core business of human rights that triggered uh, international intervention. So it looks like that the political uh, interpretation of human rights look at things at the end of the process and ignore how uh, we have come to that kind of conclusion. Uh, that's the first thing uh, I'd like to say against the political interpretation. The other is that in making the practice the ultimate uh, authority in deciding uh, what human rights are, it looks like that the political